We're back with Guy from Foz Townsend's Classic Oils, standing outside Hangar 79 with these big doors behind us, um, an icon really of the scramble events. We know a lot of you love to photograph your cars in front of these doors, uh, as do we. So we thought this would be the prime place to review two cars here. Now, Guy, what have we got? Well, we are starting with the Colin Chapman's iconic sports car design from the late 50s, the Caterham Ney Lotus 7. Uh, I'm sure everybody recognises and most people love these cars. There's never really been a sports car like it before or since and it's still in production today, incredibly, more than 60 years after it first went into production. But what I really wanted to talk about today was its brother, really, the Caterham 21, which really not many people will be familiar with at all. They only ended up making 40 of these cars and it, it's very closely based on the uh, Caterham 7, but um, they, they, they had this idea, they wanted to make, Graham Nern, who owned the company at the time, wanted to make a car that was much more usable than the 7 is. So they wanted to have proper doors, reasonable streamlining, side windows, a boot that you could get two, uh, two uh, golf sets of golf clubs in, um, and really make much more of a, a grand touring car than the 7 can ever be. The chassis is not identical, but certainly based on the 7. It's the same triangulated space frame design that the 7 has. Uh, it had the same powertrain, the K-Series, the, the optional Caterham six-speed gearbox, their, their own uh, designed in-house the Dion back end. And they launched it. The reason it's called the 21 is because it was built to celebrate the 21st anniversary of Caterham taking over production from Lotus of the 7. So 1994, the prototype of this car was, it was unveiled at the London Motor Show and to an absolute sensation. It was, it was polished aluminium. Uh, uh, it looked like, like this, but so it looked like nothing else. The bodywork done by uh, Roach Manufacturing was sensational. And of course, everyone fell in love with it. Um, in, what wasn't quite so obvious, and you can see from the photographs at the time, is that the prototype car had no exterior door handles, it didn't have a boot lid at all, um, <laughs> and the, there were subtle differences in the shape. Okay. So they found out that for such a small team, working on Ian Robertson's beautiful design, they, they, they had a lot of work to do from that prototype announcement to manufacturing production cars. So it took them more than two years really to start delivering the first cars to the public and by that time Lotus had pit them at the post and unveiled the Elise which no one had the slightest clue was coming. So the Elise of course most people know much more advanced uh, chassis all aluminium and composite all bonded mm -hmm. whereas this is this is uh, still the tubular space frame like the 7 is um, and the Elise was a, had the same engine, but it, it mid-engined, mid so just a, a more advanced design, but critically, it was considerably cheaper than the 21. Uh, and so by the time Caterham finally productionized this car, it, was, uh, it had really had its lunch uh, eaten by the, by the Elise. And so this beautiful uh, design uh, never reached uh, the potential that it could have done, and in, in the end, Caterham never intended it for it to be a, uh, a production, you know, a mass production car. They mm. wanted to make 200 a year. In the end, they only made ended up making about 40 over four years, and it and it uh, and it sort of fizzled out uh, in in late 1999. And this car is the last but one off the production line. And the design of it is so of the period as well, isn't it? Yeah. It does share a lot actually with the Elise in terms of its, its it, look it, and it, feel. It does, but, but the Elise hadn't been seen when this was done. This was done literally in uh, Jez Coates. Jez Coates was the chief engineer at Caterham at the time. He'd made it in his barn. They just put a, a, a block of expanded polystyrene <laughs> on a chassis, and then him and Ian took a chainsaws to it, and then they carved it, they sculpted the block of polystyrene until it looked right. And it, it does look right, and, and they, they, they had to make some changes from the prototype to, the, you know, the, uh, Graham Nern, who owned Caterham, wanted to make all the cars out of aluminium. But it would have had to be a £100,000 car mm. to do that. Mm. So in the end, reality bit, and they realised they'd have to make the body out of fibreglass, albeit very light fibreglass. Um, and so um, that meant 
production, productionizing a, an aluminium prototype into a fiberglass. And they thought, to begin with, they thought, well, how hard can it be? You know, a, boot, a bonnet, two doors, a boot lid, and a body tub, five panels. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five panels. But in the end, I think there are over 30 fiberglass mouldings in this because they mm -hmm. realised they had to have bonnet stiffeners, in, oh, inter okay. uh, door internal panels, uh, dashboard, the stiffeners for the boot lid. So it was a lot more complicated than they thought it was going to be. On the road, it's still distinctively Lotus 7. You can, there's a great feeling of familiarity when you hop into one of these. You can see the pedigree between the two. Absolutely. Can't you? And you're you can feel this, this feels like a 7. You yeah. know, when you're yeah. driving it, yeah. it feels you're in touch with the road like you are in a 7. Not quite as directly, because although you're sitting the same height and the same separation with your passenger, um, the, you're more insulated from the road in this car, and yeah. so it feels like a more grown-up version of the 7. The advantages are you can talk to your passenger at 80 miles an hour <laughs> without he, you know, headsets, um, but you know the, the downside that you can feel the extra, I think it weighs about 100 kilos more than the 7 the, of the same spec and um, you can feel that extra weight yeah. uh, around roundabouts and, and things like that. So it's not the visceral uh, experience that the 7 is. But this is raw, isn't That's it? That's raw. It's a little more cushioned. This is grown up. Yeah. And, you know, I think in terms of their design brief, they achieved exactly what they set out to do. They, they wanted to produce a more grown-up version of the 7, and that's exactly what they did. You know, you can take two sets of golf clubs in the back if you're that way inclined. The roof works, in fact, better than the Elise. It's much easier to put up and down than the early Elise was. Um, the windows don't wind down. That's one of the one of the hassles of, of being a very small scale production company. So these windows are fixed. You can take them out. Okay. And I don't know what you do with them then because you can't really <laughs> stow them anywhere. You can take them off, but you can't wind them down. So you know, with the roof on, uh, for a start, getting in and out is 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 a gymnastic exercise. But uh, also things like you know tickets at car parks become difficult. Yeah. because you have to open the door and you know somehow get your arm out and etc etc <laughs> so but if you just have, bring the camera around and have a look at the inside there were some some design features the interior was really a departure for caterham it's the first time they had this double sweeping cowl uh, really i think works very well the idea being that they could easily make left and right hand drive versions of the mm. car in the end they didn't make any left hand drive but uh, they could have done um, it was the first time that any caterer had had the da uh, handbrake on the centre center tunnel. Now they all do, but up to the, up to the 21, they had them at the umbrella type underneath the uh, dashboard, which just wasn't feasible in this car. So, uh, and, and the front suspension, elements of the front suspension improvements that were first done on the 21, have now found their way into uh, into other models of of Caterham 7 which of course remains in production to this day and is as, as popular today as ever before. Mm. If I just open the boot, you can get an idea of the, of the uh, size of that. I mean, for a sports car, it'll take a decent amount of luggage. It's certainly much more than a, than a seven can. You can pop the roof up and down in, in seconds. And once it's up, it's relatively waterproof. I mean, I, it's not perfect, <laughs> um, but again, one has to make uh, you know, compromises. It has to make allowances for the fact it was a small, stale car. You can also get clues from the from the fact that they had to reuse Ford Sierra tail lights just because they couldn't afford the tooling to, to do their own. I think they work well. Other people not so keen. It also uses Rover 200 uh, door mirrors and uh, Suzuki Cappuccino front indicators. Would you believe? <laughs> and there are various other bits and pieces of of uh, of other cars. But um, I think, as I say, all in all, I think a massive uh, success for them to have to have achieved anything like this and to to have uh, so many uh, they only made 40 but they're nearly all still on the road I, i've managed to track down two that are still in the hands of their original owners because they, they love them so much they'll never they'll never part with them um, and at any one time there are about 14 15 taxed and insured and on the road and everybody who has them pretty much without exception loves them it is a beautiful thing, and I'd, I'd say I'd, I'd never even heard of one before this conversation. So yeah, well, thank you for sharing. Well, that's why I wanted to bring it down. You know, just to not these neither of these cars, by the way, are for sale. This is these are both <laughs> much loved, uh, much loved uh, possessions. The twenty one's mine. The seven belongs to a friend, and uh, you know it really is. Uh, I think something that they should be proud of. You know, Caterham just to have done it at all. 
mm. uh, should be proud of it, let alone to have them. We just celebrated the car's 25th anniversary last year and they got all the cars that were on the road in this country came up to Gaydon to, uh, to, celebrate, to celebrate that. To, I think just to have done it. And I asked Ian Robertson who designed it, I said, I said to him in the Q&A at that event, you know, was this the pinnacle of his design? Because he was a really a motoring journalist. Mm. Uh, um, he was writing at the time for Autocar. Um, and so he did this literally in his spare time. And uh, I, I asked him, was this the, uh, the pinnacle of your design career? And he said, without question it is, because almost nobody today gets a chance to design an entire car from scratch. You know, they might, they might spend their, most of their career designing door handles or, or you know, little details of, yeah. of fluting somewhere on the bodywork. But to design an entire car from scratch is something that almost nobody gets a chance to do today. And, and you know, especially to produce something as good looking as this. It, it is a very, very pretty car. And they're both proper driver's cars they in, really in their are. essence, aren't they? Yeah, they really um, are. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for Not bringing it here today and Not sharing with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure.